What's up mathematicians? My name is Justin and I am so excited about this journey that we are about to embark on together. This is the first video in a new course, a course I'm calling Space. You could also call it Geometry because a lot of the things that we'll be covering are things that you would cover in a geometry course. Um, and before we get into the geometry side of it, the sort of more mathematical, computational, proving theorems, all that sort of thing, which we will get to, before we get to all that, I want to take a little bit of time to give you sort of the big picture of what we're going to do in this course and how it fits in with the broader mathematical narrative. So this is um, basically what I'm calling a roadmap of what we're going to cover in this course. It's a summary. Uh, let's see, where is it? Working up oh, a roadmap. So that's what we're doing. Uh, it's a quick summary of what we're covering and just to give you a sense of the flow of the course. Uh, and also, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about how the things that we're covering in this course fit into the broader mathematical narrative and the things that we will cover in some other courses. So without any further ado, let's begin with our roadmap. And we're actually going to start by going way back. So uh, we're going to talk about um, Hang on, let me pause this a second. Okay, thanks for bearing with me. I'm still figuring out my systems here. Uh, but as I was saying, uh, we're going to go way back. We're going to start here on our roadmap with the concept of evolution. Okay, now that might seem like kind of a strange place to start a geometry course. But basically, what I want you to understand is that geometry, like all of mathematics, is a human creation. And evolution is the mechanism that basically created us into the intelligent beings that we are, enabled us to be intelligent enough to create a system of mathematics, a system of geometry. And so any complete story of geometry uh, really needs to start with evolution. Okay, and so what did evolution give us? Well, a whole lot of things, which we don't have time to get into, but one that I want to mention here is intuition. Okay, so evolution gifted us with this tool of intuition. And part of our intuition is the ability to understand, to have a natural sense about things like numbers or quantity and also about space. So we can have a sense about how far away something is without actually measuring it or, or learning about what measurement is. We can have a sense of like how many things might be in a pile, as long as there are not too many things in the pile, without learning about numbers. So uh, the thing is, though, we have this intuition, but there is a barrier between this intuition and mathematics, at least mathematics the way I think of it. And so let's draw in that barrier here. OK, so this barrier I'm calling the barrier of deduction and abstraction. Let's go ahead and write that in here. So this is the barrier of, oops, deduction, should be a D right there, and abstraction. Okay, that's this line right here. So, in order to start doing mathematics, we need to break through this barrier. We need to go beyond our intuition and we need to embrace the tools of deduction and abstraction. Okay, so where and when did this happen? Well, it's impossible to say actually, right? And it's not, uh, it's not the case that this happened at just one time or one place in history. It happened in many places uh, in many, by many different people and societies at different times. But one place where we see this breaking of the barrier of deduction and abstraction is in the area of counting. Okay, so counting is something we're able to do naturally if it's a small quantity. Like we can natural, uh, Intuitively, even without learning about numbers, we can intuitively recognize a quantity like three. 
But if we have a large quantity, uh, we don't have the ability to naturally recognize that we need a number system for that, okay? So counting is one of these early big breaks through this barrier of deduction and abstraction. And another, uh, another break comes over here. And um, this is the breakthrough to measurement. So these are two important early mathematical activities that humans engaged in. Uh, and I want to actually show you a couple pictures of artifacts related to the practice of counting and measurement. So let's switch over to that real quick. Okay, so one of them relating to counting is uh, this thing right here. It's called the Labamba bone. Now, this is the earliest known mathematical artifact that archaeologists uh, archaeologists have discovered. It was discovered in uh, sub-Saharan Africa uh, near the border of Swaziland and South Africa, I believe it was, and it's approximately 45,000 uh, 45, years old, so really old. Um, and so we can see from this that human beings uh, did counting in some way a really long time ago. Okay, and now let's uh, look at another artifact. This is called the Nippur cubit here. This is the earliest known measuring rod. Uh, we, you could call it a ruler, right? This is like an ancient ruler um, discovered in Babylon, and it's about 4,500 years, give or take, old. So uh, another old measuring device, and finally one that I thought I'd mention here. Uh, this is an example of the weights that the Harappan civilization, the Indus Valley civilization used probably around 6,000 years ago. So the Indus Valley civilization was a civilization that existed in modern day India. So those are some ancient examples of measuring uh, and counting to illustrate the breaking of this barrier. So let's go back to here. So I wanna talk first about this track right here, counting. Well, once we learn to count, a natural next step, mathematically speaking, is creating a system of numbers. So it turns out we can count things without numbers, but numbers just make it a whole lot easier, right? Well, once we have numbers and we, we might realize like, wait, we can do a lot more with the numbers and just count things with them. And uh, we start to learn like, oh, there are these different operations we can apply to numbers. And from that, we get arithmetic. Okay, so our study of numbers naturally leads to arithmetic, doing operations, addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, etc., on numbers. And arithmetic naturally, uh, over time, uh, and this process is, you know, takes a lot of time, and there are a lot of things, obviously, I'm glossing over here, but it naturally leads towards algebra. Okay, so what is algebra? Uh, I mean, basic algebra, I'm not talking about like sort of the more advanced uh, esoteric version of algebra that you might study in college, but the algebra that we learn about in high school is really just, um, it's arithmetic, right? It's, it's performing operations on numbers. The thing is, sometimes we just don't know what those numbers are. When we're doing, in fact, typically, right, when we're doing algebra, we don't know what the numbers are. They might be a variable quantity in an equation that changes, or it might just be an unknown number that we have to solve for, solving for x, if you will. So let's throw that in there as well. So uh, sometimes we don't know what the number is, and so we represent it with a variable. So this variable, which represents some unknown quantity, or if it's in uh, an equation or a formula, it might represent a changing quantity. This is another key component of algebra, but really it still comes down to numbers and arithmetic, the operations we do on numbers. Okay, so you might look at this and be like, wait a second, you know, that's, you know, what does that have to do with geometry? This is supposed to be a course about geometry. Well, of course, that is where this other track comes in, this other break through the barrier of deduction and abstraction. Okay, so measurement. Well, 
we're going to talk a little bit more about this than this one because this is a course about geometry. So as you you know may have seen from may remember from the the artifacts that I showed earlier, an early thing that got measured is length. Right? I showed you. Oops. Sorry about that. Uh, I showed you the Nippur cubit, which is an ancient measuring rod or ancient ruler. Sorry for the misspelling there. Um, but anyway, that is length. That's something that we can measure. Another thing that we can measure is weight, right? So the Indus Valley civilization is one of the earliest known civilizations, maybe the earliest one to have done uh, done this type of measurement. The ancient Egyptians also did weight measurements. Okay, uh, and then other things that we can do when we measure, right? We can measure area or volume. So that's something else that comes with measurement. And we'll talk more about the different types of measurement later. One more thing I'll mention about measurement because Measurement will be our first unit in this course, and one of the things that we're going to talk about in that unit is trigonometry. Okay, now you may not even really know what trigonometry is, but at this point, what I want you to think of trigonometry, uh, this is how I want you to think of trigonometry. Trigonometry is just a set of tools that help us measure things. Uh, they help us measure triangles, and we can use triangles to construct all sorts of different things. So trigonometry is a set of tools that help us measure triangles and hence enable us to measure lots of other things as well. So trigonometry is really just about measurement. Okay, so um, as I mentioned with the Nippur cubit, the Babylonians uh, and also with the weights, the Egyptians are two civilizations that um, made significant advances in the in the discipline of measurement. So let's go ahead and write those down here. Now it's important to understand that other civilizations were doing measurement as well. It wasn't just the Babylonians and Egyptians, but those are the ones that are going to fit into our narrative here that we're constructing the most directly. So the Babylonians and Egyptians do a lot of measuring. Um, but the thing is, the Babylonians and Egyptians, the measurement that they did is was really practical, right? So the Babylonians want to build temples. The Egyptians wanted to build pyramids. That took a lot of measurement, right? Uh, also, the Egyptians wanted to measure the land that farmers were farming on to figure out how much tax to charge them. And so uh, this is an early important example of Ge what became geometry eventually was this measurement of land. Okay, and in fact, this is this was a real gift that the Babylonians gave um, to the Greeks. So a couple important Greek geometers that that I'll mention here are Thales and Pythagoras. Okay. Uh, you may have, you probably heard the name Pythagoras at least. You may have heard of Thales as well. Um, these are a couple important Greek geometers that made significant advances in geometry. Now, both of them, according to historical records, both of them uh, were said to have traveled to Babylon and to Egypt, and so probably got, had the chance to learn from the measurement techniques, the geometry of the Babylonians and the Egyptians. But they wanted to do something a bit more than just work with the practical applications. Okay, so uh, actually before I talk about that, let's draw on the next thing. So measurement sort of naturally leads to the big thing that we're talking about, geometry. Now, as I mentioned, the Egyptians used measurement, used geometry, to measure the area of the land. After the Nile would flood, they had to remeasure the land and figure out you know, how much tax to charge the farmers and such. Well, the thing is, the Greeks learned from, uh, the Greeks, Thales and Pythagoras, they learned from the Egyptians. And so when they gave uh, this discipline a, a name, geometry, it came from this idea of measuring the earth. Geo 
means earth and metry means measurement. So geometry really just means earth measurement if we go back to the original Greek. And so that's how the Greeks thought of geometry originally, at least where it came from. So the Babylonians and Egyptians did a bunch of measuring and measurement uh, came into you know, geometry. Okay, but as I was saying, Thales and Pythagoras were not satisfied to keep geometry as just a practical, pragmatic thing for taxation and construction. Because the more they studied geometry, the more they started to see these deeper forms under the surface. Okay, and so Thales and Pythagoras brought geometry into the study of forms and proof. Okay, so thanks to Thales and Pythagoras, we had this important leap forward in geometry. Now, one thing to, uh, one thing to notice here, I talked about this barrier of deduction and abstraction. The farther we move down, the more abstract we get, right? So counting is a lot less abstract, a lot more sort of hands-on, concrete, than algebra is. Similarly, measurement is a lot more sort of concrete, hands-on, than proving, you know, properties of abstract forms. So as we're moving down here, we're also moving farther away from the, the physical, the concrete, and more into the abstract. So something to notice there. Okay, so we have Thales and Pythagoras uh, going in this direction of forms and proof. Now, once we start proving things, one tool that we need in order to be able to create good proofs is logic. Okay, so that's, this is a key thing that we often typically is studied in a geometry course because in order to you know, write good proofs, you need logic. This is another key component. Okay, now, Logic is something that you have an intuition about as well, right? We have, and logic comes from our intuitions originally. Um, so it's, it's not the case that, you know, Babylonians and other ancient societies weren't using logic. They were, but this logic got formalized with the Greeks. And the person who really wrote the original book formalizing the study of logic was another Greek. Uh, I'm sure you've heard it. So Archim, uh, so, nope. I just wrote the wrong name here. Uh, not Archimedes, uh, it's Aristotle. Okay, so Aristotle wrote, uh, the Greek philosopher sort of wrote this original book on logic. So, um, yeah, so that's where we are here. We have with the ancient Greeks, the study of forms and proof and the study of logic. Well, the thing is, as more and more proofs piled up, uh, what was lacking was a good structure to put them into. And so the next sort of big leap forward in geometry was taking all those proofs, all those facts that had been you know, uh, verified using logic and building uh, a coherent structure uh, around them. So this is where we get the concept of axiomatic systems. So in this course, as I mentioned, the first unit will be on measurement. Oops, sorry about that. You can't see what I just wrote. Okay, so the first unit will be on measurement. After we do the unit on measurement, we'll move into logic, and we'll use logic to do a bunch of uh, proofs, and we'll also do constructions. And in the process of studying, um, uh, something called Euclidean geometry, which I'll mention Euclid in a moment here. Um, in the process of studying this, we'll be talking a lot about axiomatic systems. And this is where a very important figure shows up on the scene, and that figure is Euclid. In fact, when we talk about the geometry that we're doing, we often call it Euclidean geometry, because Euclid was the one uh, and not the only one, other people contributed to this as well, but Euclid took all these geometric facts and structured them into one sort of coherent system of geometry. Wrote 
the most, probably the most famous math book ever written, one of the most famous books ever written, Euclid's Elements. Uh, this is a book that you can still get in bookstores today, and it was written 2,300 years ago. So this book has a lot of staying power. Uh, very important book in the history of geometry. So that's where Euclid shows up in this area of axiomatic systems. Okay, so eventually this study of forms and the study of algebra end up sort of naturally coming back together. And the discipline that results from those two disciplines sort of coming together is known as analytic geometry. Uh, this is also called coordinate geometry. Okay, so analytic geometry or coordinate geometry is where we're going to sort of end this course. It's the discipline that comes from bringing algebra, the study of counting numbers, arithmetic algebra, this track, coming together with measurement, geometry, and forms. Those two come together in analytic geometry. Now, uh, there are many connections between geometry and algebra. Um, but this is where uh, they sort of naturally come together and, and many important disciplines come out of this combining algebra and geometry. This takes place on the coordinate plane and it gives us important tools for physics, for calculus, for all sorts of different things. Uh, now, the mathematicians that are typically credited with the uh, development of analytic geometry are a couple of French mathematicians named uh, Descartes and Fermat. Now there are many other mathematicians who contributed to this as well. Um, uh, I can't mention all of them, but analytic geometry is sometimes even called Cartesian geometry because Descartes was the one who came up with the coordinate plane as we sort of uh, you know, in the version that we know it today. Uh, Descartes also gave us the variable x. Well, you know, other societies definitely use variables, but Descartes was the one who started using x as the sort of typical variable in algebra. So important contributions um, and basically the development of the analytic geometry that we know today coming from these French mathematicians. Okay, however, there is one other topic that I do need to mention before we wrap up. So these ideas around forms and proof uh, lead mathematicians to think also about this abstract idea of space. Uh, along with the idea of axiomatic systems, th these thinking, uh, the sort of studying space and understanding, studying axiomatic systems and, and how uh, the different assumptions that are made uh, cre you know, impact the system that's created or generated leads to a very interesting and important branch of geometry uh, that I'm going to call curved space. Okay, so all the geometry that we're doing up here when we study Euclidean geometry is all going to be on flat space, but curvature shows up and sort of shakes things up, changes the game, and in, in our study of curvature, um, we'll look at different mathematicians, including uh, Gauss and Riemann. And um, they sort of laid the groundwork for what was needed for Einstein to develop the theory of relativity and things like that. And also just gave us all sorts of new, interesting, and fun uh, versions of geometry that give us new insights into what space may actually be like, or just fun things to play with. Um, so this is sort of a roadmap of the course. Um, just to clarify where we're going to go, we start with measurement, which will include some trigonometry. From there, we move into logic. And after our unit on logic, we spend a fair amount of time in this like sort of forms and proof and axiomatic systems, what I call Euclidean geometry where we will prove a bunch of theorems and develop 
um, sort of build up the axiomatic system of Euclidean geometry. After that, we're going to go not quite chronologically. We're going to go into curve space, which actually came after analytic geometry. We're going to do some, spend some time looking at this, and then we'll end the course with this connection, the synthesis between algebra and geometry uh, in the discipline of analytic geometry. So yeah, that's uh, maybe a not so quick overview, but hopefully you find it helpful uh, in understanding where we're going to be going. And I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Bye-bye.